Twist of Fate by Adriana in the Snow, Chapter 3. Janice had grown skilled over the last few years at shopping with the little money they were able to find. They'd found that finding lost money was less dangerous than begging, as it didn't draw as much attention to them, or stealing, which could put them at risk. But it was also based on luck, and therefore not as lucrative. With Remus's abilities, they could easily pull in at least $20 a week, which was enough, but not enough to spend carelessly. They'd usually spend about $2 on bread from the bakery. Then, they'd spend about $10 on canned protein like beans and sometimes meat, $5 on vegetables and fruit, and save the rest for bad weeks. They'd managed to get enough for a big bag of rice a while back that also helped. The only problem was building a fire to boil the water, but they managed. They always managed. Overall, life could be a lot worse, which was something Janice always remembered when Remus steered them down a different path. Remus was humming what Janice thought might be Bring Around the Rosie as they walked back down the street toward the bakery. He'd been in a good mood ever since he'd gotten his cookie. Janice was also in a good mood, but that had less to do with the cookie and more to do with the fact that they'd had enough money to spare to buy a few potatoes. It would be nice to eat something hearty and fresh for a change. They'd have to wait to eat them until later in the week when they had more daylight left to cook them, but it was something to look forward to. Now it was beginning to get dark. Most of the stores were closing or closed, and they needed to get back to their shed soon. His mind was on dinner plans for the night when they came up on the bakery. Janice actually noticed Patton before Remus did, but he didn't think anything of it. The man was locking up the store. He turned away from it and took a step toward the street, likely intending to cross to the parking lot on the other side of it. That's when Remus's humming stopped. Remus's hand came up to point at the man. He's going to get hit by a car, Remus said, his tone matter-of-fact. He always spewed out his predictions calmly, no matter how horrible. The screaming and crying would inevitably come later. Janus wasn't sure what compelled him that day. Perhaps he was used to taking action whenever Remus spat out a prediction. Perhaps he saw he was close enough and simply didn't want to stand idly by and watch whatever Remus already saw in his head. Perhaps he just had the image of a freshly decorated cookie in his mind. No matter the reason, however, he found his hands dropping the bags of groceries they had been holding, and his legs propelling him forward and into the street just as a car turned in a nearby corner going far too fast. He felt himself shift a bit on instinct to make his legs spring just a bit more and make him run faster. The novel use of his powers sent a searing sensation through his muscles that would have hurt if he'd had time to think about it, but he did not slow. He rammed into Patton with enough force that they both went flying and tumbled toward the sidewalk on the opposite side of the road from the bakery. Many things happened in that moment. First, there was Patton. Patton had started working at the bakery when he'd moved back into his parents' house after they'd passed. He'd known the owner for years, and the idea had been that since she was getting older, she'd eventually let him buy it. Having no living relatives, she'd even written him into her will in case she passed before then, not knowing that it was never meant to be, because he was fated to die years before she did. He was meant to die this day. From the moment he'd been born, the car rocketing down the street right now had been moving towards him. Everything he'd ever done had brought him to that street at that time, from his choice to make cupcakes all by himself from his father's birthday when he was eight, to the decision to do sweeping early so he could get home sooner today. He would have died before the ambulance got there. It always had been strange to the people who knew him that Patton had so few soul marks. He always seemed to have a lot of love to give. Yet, with that car always in the distance, there was no way he'd be around long enough for more people to etch such a mark into his skin. Today, fate twisted. It wasn't unheard of for people to gain soul marks later in life, but it was quite rare. And then it was usually only one or two. In fact, in Patton's lifetime, there had only been one recorded case. Usually, fate was set. It took a very strong power to make any large enough change in the world to alter soul marks. Yet, in the face of a psychic like Remus, whose predictions were some of the clearest and strongest in history, things could be changed. And, when a death so written into someone's destiny was prevented, a lot of things changed. As he fell, Patton may have felt a strange prickling feeling across his skin. He, however, was not paying attention to that, far too distracted and confused. All he knew was that by the time he hit the ground, both of his hands were covered in marks. Later, when he went home, he'd notice even more in other places, but the ones he'd noticed then were the obvious ones, the ones on his hands. Then there was Janice. 
Before he jumped, Janice had only one soul mark on his body when he hadn't shifted more onto himself to blend in. At least, he had only one soul mark that hadn't been burnt off years ago. Instead, the marks adorning the left side of his face were made by acid. They had once been soul marks, but his parents had died when he was seven, and he had been swooped up by Halo Mark before the normal channels or anyone else that may have wanted to take him realized what had happened. They had a policy with new kids to burn off soul marks, whether colored in already or otherwise. For three years, he'd had no soul marks. Then, one day, a smaller boy had shown up, only seven at the time. He'd not gained a soul mark on that day, but Janice had been nice to the scared child with the haunted eyes. More importantly, as he'd learned, he'd put the idea into the seven-year-old's head that he could lie. Up until then, Remus had always reported exactly what he saw and how he saw it. He'd been very valuable in that way. But Janice had put the idea in his head to use his visions for himself instead of others, especially others that hurt him. The next thing he knew, Janice was free. The second Remus had pulled him from the building they'd been held in and out onto the busy city street, new soul marks had appeared on Janice's wrist and on Remus's arm. It was the first time Remus had ever changed fate with his predictions himself. Today, Janice lost his shift somewhere midair. When he landed on top of Patton, he did not notice the marks that suddenly appeared on his arm and face. He assumed the weird tingle was from the way he'd recently extended his powers. Patton did, however, notice two little designs fade in on the face of the boy on top of him, one along the side of his nose and the other one right below the scarring on the left side of his face. The second was already colored in blue by the time they hit the ground. And, they would learn later, the two in a tangle of limbs were not the only people affected by that change in fate that day. In fact, many people were, but only a few actually knew something had happened in that moment. First, there was Remus, of course. He felt the prickle of the newly drawn soul marks that suddenly appeared on his face, hands, back, and chest. He looked away from the scene for a moment to blink down at the one on his pinky in confusion, and then looked back up. Second, a man about to walk into his night class at the local community college froze halfway through his step, confused and concerned. His first thought was that he was having a stroke at twenty-eight, but the strange tingly feeling faded after a moment. When he caught sight of his hands, he turned and rushed off to the bathroom to see why the back of his neck had been tingling, too. Last, hundreds of miles away in a different city, a boy jerked up suddenly in his bed with a gasp. He shook the boy sleeping beside him awake. Logan, he said, something good just happened. As the last word left the boy's lips, the car that had been meant to hit Patton disappeared around another turn, still going too fast. Patton looked up at the child who had fallen on top of him. He slowly reached up to gently touch the side of his face near the burns. The new yellow soul mark on the back of his hand was the same shape as the filled-in one on the boy's lower cheek. Hi, said Patton.